was beautiful. I might take you with me. Just kind of calm me down before the service. So it's very good to be with you all this morning. Um, hope you've been enjoying this uh, crisp autumn weather, and it is very good to be in the house of the Lord. And it's very good to see new faces here. That's a good sign. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, help us to listen to your word, teach us your will, and guide us into a deeper and richer understanding of your love for us. Be with us as we open your word and allow the Holy Spirit to speak to our heart. In the name of the one who loved us and died to save us. Amen. This past September, Bill O'Reilly released his latest book, Killing Jesus. Anybody read it? In the postscript of his book, O'Reilly, a self-proclaimed Catholic, describes after his research what he found most profound. First was an intriguing question. Why did thousands of common people seek out Jesus of Nazareth? Why did they come? What was Jesus doing that prompted so many people to set aside their daily labor to be near him? Then he makes a profound statement of fact. Jesus of Nazareth, the most famous human being the world has ever known, had no infrastructure, no government behind him, and no corporation. He and his disciples depended on the charity of others for food and shelter, and they had no organization other than a dozen faithful followers. In the history of mankind, no one has achieved worldwide fame with no outside, no outside resources whatsoever. He begins the book with the fact that Jesus of Nazareth was the most influential man who ever lived. Nearly 2,000 years after his brutal execution by Roman soldiers, more than 2.2 billion human beings attempt to follow his teaching and believe he is God. This includes 77% of the U.S. population, according to a Gallup poll, if we believe polls. The teachings of Jesus have shaped the entire world, world and continue to do so. Our scripture reading for this morning comes from Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20. So please follow along in your pew Bibles as we read together the day Jesus establishes his church. Hear the word of God as it's recorded in Matthew 16. As Jesus asks his disciples several interesting and assuming questions. Now, beginning with verse 13. Now when Jesus came to the district of Caesarea, Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. And he said to them, but who do you say I am? Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. And then he strictly 
charges the disciples to tell no one that he is the Christ. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the first time the word church was recorded in any of the four Gospels. While Jesus had no infrastructure, no organization, no political party, no army, and no capital, he establishes his church, but not without another type of infrastructure, another type of of capital. First, he examines the hearts of these disciples to determine if they really know who he is and more importantly, believe he is God. He goes about this inquiry by asking them who others say he is. Now, what's interesting about this is those who began to seek him out by, quote, setting aside their daily labor to be near him, to quote Bill O'Reilly, are not the ones who really knew who he was. Verse 14, and they said, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So why John the Baptist? John the Baptist has just been killed by Herod, and many thought Jesus was John the Baptist resurrected, because John the Baptist was a prophet. And this was not only popular speculation among the people, but even with Herod himself. Elijah was on the list because of the last verse in the Old Testament, or last verses in the Old Testament, from Malachi 4, 5 through 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and awesome day the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of fathers to their children and the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. So Elijah was a good answer, but it was the wrong answer. Jeremiah was another good but wrong answer. It may have been because the Jewish tradition preserved in the second book of Maccabees, uh, chapter 2, verses 4 through 8, that he had preserved the Ark of the Covenant, Jeremiah, and the altar of incense at the time of the destruction of Jerusalem by the Babylonians, and he would come again to restore them at the start of the Messianic age. Now, what was surprising about these answers? that the people who were following Jesus, who they thought he was. No one was suggesting or even thought that Jesus might be the Messiah. Apparently, Jesus did not match up to anyone's messianic expectation. Then Jesus asked the second question. He said to them, but who do you say I am? Now this question had to be correct, not just a good answer. Jesus needed to know and believe his disciples knew who he was before he could hand over to them the keys to the kingdom. So how does Peter answer and does he have the correct answer? Verse 16, Simon Peter replied, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Peter gets the answer right, but how he comes to the answer is what is important. Verse 17, And Jesus answered him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Peter knows who Jesus is, the living God, not because of something he observed in Jesus, but something that was revealed to him by God himself. 
Now this has been referred to as Peter's confession. This confession was the direct result of a specific divine revelation. The church is built on the belief that Jesus is God. The church's very existence is dependent on that fact. A fact that comes not from historical data about Jesus, but from the specific divine revelation that Jesus is God. Earlier I mentioned the Bill O'Reilly's book, Killing Jesus. This book, written in much the same manner and format as the, uh, his other two books, Killing Lincoln and Killing Kennedy. They're books that take that one significant event, the assassination of Lincoln, Kennedy, and Jesus, and research the events going on historically, politically, culturally, and even religiously that led up to those fateful days. O'Reilly has qualified in the Killing Jesus book that this is not a spiritual look at who Jesus is. He never calls him the Messiah, never refers to him as the Christ. He is simply looking at Jesus as a man from Nazareth who was executed by the powerful forces of his day. He doesn't talk about any of the specific miracles Jesus performed, his virgin birth, his resurrection, other than to say there were several eyewitness accounts of Jesus after his death and his body has never been discovered. This, in his words, is a fact-based book. And he goes on to say that we do not aim to suggest we know everything about Jesus. That being said, for someone who knows Jesus Christ is the Son of the living God, this is a great book on the historical background of the life and times of Jesus. But Jesus did not establish his church on what he did, but who he was. He hands the keys to the kingdom to Peter and the other disciples because they knew Jesus was the Christ. Not just someone whose movement may change the world. Now there have been many movements that have changed the way we see and do things. In our lifetimes, there's been a labor movement, a civil rights movement, a woman's movement, to name a few. There are movements that change the way things are done for a period of time. These, these movements come and go as things in society change. There is an ebb and flow to social movements. If we look at the historical account of what Jesus did while on earth, we can see how he changed the way we treat each other with his philosophy of peace and love. But the church was not established on the philosophy of peace and love, but on the fact that Jesus was God. The church would be the vehicle that would transmit not a philosophy, but the message of the cross, which is Jesus' love for us, and the empty tomb, which is Jesus' power over death. These two important facts do not negate the philosophy of peace and love. In fact, they support it. Without the cross, we cannot experience the peace of God in our lives. Without the empty tomb, we have no power to love others as we love ourselves. So my question this morning is, what would Jesus think of the church today? in the year 2013. Do we believe and preach Jesus is God? What happens when those outside of Christ doubt the existence of Jesus' miracles? They believe there was a guy named Jesus, but did he really turn water into wine? Did he really feed over 5,000 people? 
his virgin birth, his bodily resurrection, and life after death. How many churches <coughs> preach these events with certainty? How many churches believe what they affirm every Sunday in the Apostles' Creed? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. Do you? Do you really believe that God's word was enough to put all this in place? Do you believe in the sovereignty of God? The, the church of Jesus Christ was not established on the historical Jesus. A Jesus that can be verified in historical documents, confirmed scientifically, or accepted by our rational thinking. When we reduce Christ to a historical Jesus, we strip him and our faith of the power of a sovereign living God who wanted to have a relationship with us so badly that he sent his own son to die in our stead. While historically there may have been forces at work that were the vehicle God used or allowed to complete his mission, the mission itself was ordained, and that great Presbyterian word, predestined, before the beginning of time. Somewhere in time and space, the Godhead Three, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, made a decision on who of the three would come to earth as a human and rescue the human race by dying for their sins. Those sins that kept us from a relationship with God. God used the historical and political events of the day to complete the work of Christ on the cross and conquer death for every believer. The Church of Jesus Christ was established because the Holy Spirit revealed to the disciples that Jesus was God. The Church of Jesus Christ continues to exist today because the Holy Spirit reveals to our hearts that Jesus is God. And his death on the cross, cross was more than an event in the struggle between good and evil at the time Rome dominated the Western world. The gates of hell have not prevailed against her, not because of anything the church has done to, th to thwart that, but the Holy Spirit has done to protect her. When we as a church or the church, reduce our faith to the historical Jesus that can be examined in books like Killing Jesus, regardless of how intriguing and interesting a read, we limit the power of the Holy Spirit to work within the church to reach those without Christ. We limit the power the church can give to change lives to restore hope to a broken relationship, to bring peace to a family, and to enable us to love one another as we love ourselves. The Apostle Paul in the early church, church never preached an historical fact-based Jesus. In Paul's letter to the church at Corinth, he writes in 1 Corinthians 1, beginning with verse 21, For since in the wisdom of God the world did not know God through wisdom, it pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For the Jews demanded a sign and the Greeks seek wisdom. Now the Greeks wanted that historical Jesus what he did, what he taught, how he changed our thinking. I mean, they were all about the philosophy. The Jews wanted a sign that he was empowered by
by God to deliver them from Roman occupation, not die as a common criminal at their hands. But how does Paul answer those two ideas of who Jesus is? Verse 23, but we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to the Jews and folly to the Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and G Greeks, Christ, the power of God, and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The early church preached the work of Christ on the cross. Paul asserts that we can only find redemption for our sins and sinful nature by looking toward Calvary, where on the cross God made himself most fully known. For Paul in the early church, finding who Christ is begins with Christ dying for sinners and sinners finding redemption, not in something they could do for themselves. The work of Christ on the cross is for the church the only sacrifice that can make humanity righteous before God. The cross. I wear one. Many of us wear them. Must always remain utterly uncomfortable. In this book, he goes on to graphically talk about the crucifixion. That was the part I skipped. But it always has to remain uncomfortable. For the Jews who sought God through their own moral law-abiding effort, the cross was more than uncomfortable, it was disgraceful. It re represented punishment for wrongdoing, defiant behavior, rebellion. For the Greeks, who sought God through the exercise of the mind, the cross was offensive. Their gods had supernatural powers or intellectual wit that could have saved the day by rescuing someone from such an egregious punishment and death. For us today, the cross must reveal the judgment of God that no amount of good deeds could make humanity moral. No amount of diligent study could make humans truly wise. And no amount of human effort could provide everlasting joy and peace. The church was given the keys to the kingdom of God because the church believed in the cross and the empty tomb. In his letter to the Galatians, Paul in the first chapter reminds us that the good news about the cross and the empty tomb can only come from God because it's all about God. In Christ, God entered human history and the human heart. It takes both to establish his church a movement or an organization that the gates of hell will not succeed in wiping off the face of the earth. So the question today for this church, this particular community believers in 2013 is, who do you say Jesus is? Is he an historical Jesus that you can talk about with your friends and family and co-workers that doesn't make them uncomfortable? that can be ver verified both historically and scientifically? Or is he Jesus, the Christ, the Son of the living God, who loved you enough to die for you and was sovereign enough to conquer death so you can live with him forever? What Bill O'Reilly either does not know or would not admit in this particular book was the fact that it was the power of the Holy Spirit that enabled those dozen or so disciples to begin a movement 
that continues today. That same Holy Spirit is available to this church in this century, just as it has been for the history of Christian Christianity. To change lives, to bring peace to our hearts, to restore our relationship to God, and to forgive our sins. So, WWJT, what would Jesus think about this church? Let us pray. Father, thank you for your Holy Spirit who continues to move and work in our lives and your church. Help us to rely on the power of the cross and the glory of the empty tomb as we spread the good news of your love and peace to a dark and dying world. In Christ's name, amen. Brothers and sisters, as we leave this place, always remember that in Christ, God entered human history and the human heart to establish his church. Who we say Jesus is depends on who he is for us personally. When we preach Christ crucified, we incorporate the love of God that sent Jesus to the cross and the power of God that resulted in an empty tomb. When as the church we embrace those truths, the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Amen.